Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the International Dyslexia Association's webinar series sponsored by Hood Education. My name is Guy Harrington, and I'm the CEO of Hood Education. We'd like to welcome you to this morning's presentation. A few housekeeping notes prior to starting. As many of you are aware, October is Dyslexia Awareness Month. The International Dyslexia Association's annual conference will take place in Orlando, Florida from October 26th through the 29th. If you have not yet registered, please do so. Today's web webinar will be approximately one hour in length. During the presentation, please submit any questions that you may have under the Q&A tab located at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Moats will attempt to answer some of your questions at the conclusion of the presentation. The presentation, the slideshow, and any answers to remaining questions will be posted within seven to 10 days at the International Dyslexia Association's website and on hoodeducation.com. A link will be provided by the IDA in a follow-up email where you can access this information as well as the certificate for your participation in today's presentation. This morning's webinar, IDA's Knowledge and Practice Standards, How They Can Improve Reading Instruction for All Students, is provided to you by Dr. Louisa Motes. Dr. Motes is a president of the Motes Associate Consulting Incorporated and has served as a national board member and vice president of IDA. She earned her master's in learning disabilities special education at Peabody College of Vanderbilt and her doctorate in reading and human development from Harvard Graduate School of Education. Dr. Motes has been a teacher, a psychologist, a researcher, a graduate school faculty member, and author of many influential scientific journal articles, books, and policy papers on topics of reading, spelling, language, and teacher preparation. In addition to the Letters Professional Development series, her books include Speech to Print, Language Essentials for Teachers, Spelling, Development, Disability, and Instruction, Straight Talk About Reading with Susan Hall, and Basic Facts About Dyslexia and Other Reading Problems with Karen Dakin. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our presenter for today, Dr. Louisa Motes. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'll be able to talk about my favorite subject with you for about an hour here. So let's start at the beginning. Um, how are these standards developed? And I assume everyone who's on the webinar today knows that the knowledge and practice standards were written and adopted by IDA in the year 2010. We assembled a committee to develop the standards in uh, 2009 because many of us for years have been frustrated by our uh, experience uh, training teachers um, and recognizing that many teachers who were already licensed and already in the classroom had not had the benefit of really meaningful and research-based instruction themselves that would enable them to reach the students in their classrooms who struggled to develop reading skills. So I, as a board member at the time, assembled a committee of uh, wonderful uh, people who represented different points of view, but who all shared a sense of mission and uh, a history of involvement in teacher preparation. And together, we generated the standards. The purpose of the standards and this is very important for everyone to realize, was to guide the preparation, the certification, and the professional development of those who teach reading and related literacy skills in classroom, remedial, and clinic settings. So notice that our uh, target audience for the standards is anyone who teaches reading, not necessarily a person who identifies themselves as a specialist in the remediation of dyslexia. And I'll explain why in a minute. So uh, we want to embed uh, knowledge about teaching students with dyslexia within the larger umbrella of what any teacher needs to know in order to address those students that they will inevitably have in their classrooms. And our focus in writing the standards was uh, all teachers, including those who get an elementary credential, 
uh, especially those who get an elementary credential that uh, necessitates uh, preparation in reading instruction. That's because, number one, the majority of students who experience difficulties learning to read never get an official diagnosis of dyslexia and often are never referred to special education or remedial services. They're just there in the classrooms. And um, uh, secondly, um, uh, it is unreasonable to expect that remedial and special education services are going to be able to do the whole job of teaching students when uh, the first people who encounter those students as they're struggling to learn to read are the regular classroom teachers. Uh, so, uh, the standards also are very grounded in scientifically based and clinically proven practices. We added the phrase clinically proven practices because we wanted to honor the collective wisdom of all those um, clinicians who have refined practices that are helpful in reaching students who are uh, uh, diagnosed as having reading disabilities and who are referred to special settings, special schools and clinics, as well as to special ed services in, the reg in, in regular schools. And we also developed the standards to protect the interests of the consuming public because we feel it's the right of parents who send their children to school uh, to expect that a teacher who teaches their child will be adequately uh, prepared as professionals to recognize and to remediate uh, reading difficulties and related problems. Of course, in the background here are the statistics everyone should know at this point, that reading difficulties are the most common cause of academic failure and underachievement. Um, and depending on which study you look at and what criteria are used, we estimate that between, uh, well, conservatively, you could say five to 17% are affected by specific reading disabilities and they exist on a spectrum of severity. And 85% of all the children who are referred for learning disabilities have a primary uh, presenting problem in reading and or language. We also know from our national assessment of educational progress that the proportion of students who have real struggles with reading has not changed very much in the last 20 years and it's uh, between 33 and 36 percent of fourth graders depending on the year that we look at and the estimate of those who are proficient is um, a third or less uh, across the country. So uh, we wouldn't be campaigning for improvement in teacher preparation and teacher support and professional development unless we had evidence that educating teachers more effectively could have a profound, meaningful effect on results with students. And the, the pessimists among us usually um, say, well, this is, this is too much for us to really make a difference in. It's impossible, but it's not impossible. And these statistics from the State of California Reading Initiative uh, between 1997 and 2002 uh, are great evidence that we can significantly improve the number of students who um, are, are, are brought into the average range. And in those days, this, the Stanford Achievement Test was used statewide to measure um, the uh, result, end of year results with students. So we can see that over that five year period, significant uh, changes occurred statewide. Um, and that it should encourage all of us 
who are who have bad days thinking nothing can be done that over a five year period California made a huge dent in its collective reading problem. Also, we have evidence from carefully designed scientific research across a number of studies. These are some of the major ones that are often cited in, uh, in research summaries that we can reduce the percent of first grade students who score below the 30th percentile um, at, uh, to um, 5% or less in a number of these studies. Some of them were done uh, with uh, specialized instruction in small groups, and some of them were done as classroom interventions. But nevertheless, the evidence is pretty strong that if we start early, we intervene early with the, in the right way, the teachers know what to do, they have the tools to, to uh, implement the instruction, that we can reduce reading failure significantly. So what works best? Um, again, the consensus in the scientific literature is very strong in support of structured language teaching, in support of multi-component approaches that address all of the critical uh, 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 subcomponents of, uh, of reading acquisition, and those, of course, include phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, and writing, I would add there. And all of these were named by the National Reading Panel and in fact are um, frequently used as uh, organizing devices for reporting research and investigating relationships among these components. We also know that teacher-led instruction, rather than student-focused and, and uh, uh, holistic types of approaches where students are, are directing themselves, um, is, is much more effective for students at risk. And we know that the emphasis should be on building foundational reading skills until students become proficient at reading. We also know that not all students with reading difficulties are alike, so a teacher has to know how to adjust content and methodology and intensity of instruction according to student needs. Um, the central organizing uh, uh, concept for me in developing teacher training materials is that when we teach reading and writing, we are teaching language, and therefore, the teacher who is well equipped to remediate the problems of students who struggle to learn to read and write must be well trained in language. And that's why all the things I write are entitled language essentials for teachers. And what we mean by that is that uh, uh, teachers need to know uh, what phonology is, they need to know how the orthography of English is organized and structured, they need to have a sense of uh, meaningful relationships in semantics and uh, morphology, the meaningful structures within words, and also they need to know about the structure of discourse and um, how to teach uh, comprehension of syntax and generation of syntax to students who do not manage language easily and well. Well, if we look at the current state of teacher preparation and lic licensing, uh, for example, the several reports that have been issued by the National Council on Teacher Quality beginning in 2006, the evidence is overwhelming that current licensing and professional development practices that have been endorsed by many states are insufficient for the preparation and support of teachers and specialists. So one of the reasons we developed the IDA standards was that we agreed with this formulation wholeheartedly. And also we had seen for ourselves many times over the, um, the uh, finding of NCTQ that within schools of education, if you looked at the syllabi that were being used in reading education courses, that these basic 
pillars of reading instruction, if you will, were not even taught in the majority of teacher preparation programs as they were currently designed. And we also looked at the evidence um, that only 11% uh, uh, of the syllabi that NCTQ reviewed taught anything about each of these five basic components of reading instruction that are so strongly supported by research. And 22%, and this is what astonished me, 22% of these courses for teachers did no instruction in any of the, of the um, major components of reading. So you have to ask what in the world is going on. And it was these findings that propelled us to go ahead and, and articulate our own standards. Also, um, the conclusion of NCTQ that much of current reading instruction remains mired in a view of reading instruction that is incompatible with the science of reading. We felt at IDA we were in a unique position because of IDA's historical uh, relationship with the scientific community and the liaison that exists in IDA between the community of educators and clinicians and the community of people doing basic research in neuroscience, in educational psychology, in cognitive and development psych developmental psychology, that we had a very good grasp on what it would mean to uh, uh, formulate a view of teacher preparation that was compatible with the science of reading. Um, we also felt uh, that, that uh, we needed to articulate um, a contrast between this ongoing um, state of affairs where reading was described as a natural organic process despite the, the fact that there was no evidence to, to support that point of view. Um, we needed to define what it would mean to teach a student for whom reading was unnatural and who was dependent on a knowledgeable teacher uh, to learn how to read. So uh, over about 15 years, there have been a series of studies of teachers, what teachers know, how what they know affects what they do, um, how professional development can affect what teachers do and what they know, the interaction between what teachers know, and what they do. And these are the major journals who uh, by 2009 had published either a series of studies by major researchers in, in the area of teacher knowledge and teacher practice, um, or um, uh, we're, we're summarizing the findings up to that point. And I would like to also, uh, for the record, thank the IDA for publishing my first paper in 1994 called The Missing Foundation in Teacher Education, which then was picked up by the American Federation of Teachers <clears throat> and uh, which reached a much larger audience, probably because at that time it was striking a chord. But uh, after that uh, sort of seed that we sowed in 1994 by pointing out the problem of poor teacher training, many uh, uh, very accomplished colleagues of mine um, went ahead and published a series of studies and papers uh, really looking carefully at the dynamics of uh, teacher growth and development and teacher practice, trying to get at the heart of uh, why this has been so difficult to accomplish and how we can approach teacher professional development and, and preparation in a more constructive and effective way. So uh, these are uh, just a few of the findings about uh, teacher knowledge and teacher practice. In study after study, teaching experience appears unrelated or only somewhat related to knowledge of language structure or the processes of reading development. So one of the findings is that just because you're a teacher and you're 
faced with these kids day in and day out, sometimes for 20 years, it doesn't mean that you automatically have insight into what's going on with kids who struggle and kids who have uh, language and reading and spelling and writing problems. You can, you can uh, be misinformed or, or have a view that is not uh, supported by scientific evidence and it doesn't sort of automatically correct itself uh, when you're faced with students day in and day out. And I can uh, vouch for that personally. Uh, when I was trained way back when, I was taught that perceptual motor problems were the origin of all learning difficulties. And I would have gone on, I'm sure, uh, advising uh, other teachers and my principal to do visual motor training with kids. I would have continued that because there was no way that I knew, I didn't know what I didn't know. I had no uh, formal training in language to understand uh, what was actually happening with the students. So what do we know about this declarative knowledge base or the knowledge of content that we want teachers to gain in order to be effective teachers of reading and, and students with reading difficulties? Well, one thing we've learned from the series of studies mostly done by my colleagues and, and, and also I would say from my uh, extensive experience working with teachers across the country and in various settings, the schemas are established early and are very hard to change. So the initial training that a teacher receives, the modeling, uh, the sort of cognitive set, uh, we call that a schema, um, for understanding reading is established very early and sometimes it's established by the teacher's own personal experience. So if the teacher had no problem learning to read and can barely remember and thinks that they were, they just took to it like a duck to water, um, <clears throat> then they'll assume falsely that everyone learns that way. And if they had a professor in their first course, that uh, taught them that reading was a natural organic process and the most important thing was authentic text in the classroom. That's where they come to it with and it's very hard to change that set once it's established. <clears throat> so, uh, and why is that the case? It's because the concepts that you do need to understand in order to become a good teacher of language-based learning is uh, the, are, are elusive. They're not natural for teachers and they're not natural for students. They are acquired through a formal coursework where there is uh, uh, an organized presentation of a set of concepts that teachers gradually learn and build on for quite a few months actually. So teachers' natural preferences and judgments and intuitions are often at odds with scientific evidence. Uh, so this is a paradox that we run into all the time. It has to be taken into account as we are planning initiatives that involve changing teachers to be more effective and learning things that don't come naturally or easily. Um, uh, a couple of the studies I'd like to mention, Anne Cunningham and her colleagues have done wonderful work. She's, she's at Berkeley. Um, she asked teachers how they would, th these were first grade teachers, how would they prefer to teach reading if they could outline what they would do within the allotted time for teaching reading? What are their natural preferences? And, and she ended up concluding that, quote, it appears that a philosophical orientation towards literature-based instruction tends to be more exclusive of other instructional uh, approaches. And what that means is when you have uh, a sort of whole language literature-based uh, uh, orientation, you're likely to be psychologically kind of defended against um, uh, what then can be seen as a more mechanical and less enjoyable and less authentic and meaningful approach to teaching reading. And it's, it's, it's hard to undo that uh, uh, in, in short order. Anyway, it's difficult. So teachers' preferred practices don't conform to current research and policy recommendations. This is Anne Cunningham's uh, conclusion there with that 
study. And then um, Susan Brady, who's been a colleague uh, for a long time and has done fabulous work in this area and on whom I rely for great formulations about what's going on, concluded in her uh, study with first grade teachers that their philosophical framework about reading instruction is germane to the extent that teachers um, uh, learn the content of direct methods of instruction. Those with a whole language orientation were less responsive to professional development in phonology, phonics, and spelling. Those aspects of instruction uh, that are so critical to reaching kids with uh, learning difficulties, um, they lower 30, 40% of kids. Um, and, and, and so this, these philo philosophical arguments we get into are very important for um, determining practice. And she said teachers who performed well on the phonics tasks uh, on testing preferred to spend more time on explicit systematic instructional practices and less time on unstructured literature activities. So this was a, a documentation that the more teachers understood about um, the uh, underlying mechanics of learning the code, the more willing they were to refine their instruction in that area and spend time on it. So prior knowledge of language plays a role in teachers' choices of instructional activities. And then uh, we have a number of studies. Mine was just uh, one exploratory study, but this was a very good one by Spencer et al. Uh, published in speech, uh, language, speech, and hearing in the schools, looking at the phonemic awareness skills of SLPs and other educators. And this to me was very striking because this was not a study I had done, but the findings were absolutely in line with uh, my less formal observations over many years. And this is simply that phonemic awareness, as much as we talk about it, is very elusive for adults as well as for teachers. And if these are the, uh, this is percent correct of um, SLPs and teachers being able to identify the number of phonemes, separate speech sounds in the words that are in the left-hand column. Uh, and you can see just eyeballing this, that SLPs do, are not getting these, uh, the counting of speech sounds 100% correct by any means. And teachers are worse at it because they have less training at it. But nevertheless, we should never assume that teachers uh, ha are phonemically aware, and it is unwise to ask them to teach students before we have taught them. Uh, Shane Piasta has done some wonderful work in this area as well, and in her 2009 study in Scientific Studies of Reading, she was able to demonstrate that um, students' gains were predicted by the interaction between teacher knowledge and the amount of explicit decoding instruction that students received. That's very important to document those relationships. And, um, and it, it, this study was unique in that it showed that uh, just giving teachers a highly scripted curriculum doesn't solve the problem. It cannot replace the expert teaching of highly knowledgeable teachers because uh, the, the teachers with the lowest level of understanding of what they were doing were actually got worse results with the, the scripted curriculum. The, the scripted curriculum wasn't enough. So the answer to our national reading problem is not simply giving teachers a well-designed curriculum, although I would argue that it certainly is very difficult to teach without one. Um, Deborah McCutcheon has done several very, very strong studies uh, in this area. And what I like so much about her work is that um, she argued for the importance of um, intensive instruction for teachers. So she did one study with kindergarten and first grade teachers, another study with teachers at grades th uh, three through five. And showing that if for 10 days in a summer institute of intensive training, she emphasized instruction for teachers in the structure of language, basically, and in basic methodologies, that uh, the 
increase in teacher knowledge did uh, have a measurable positive effect on low performing students gains in reading as measured by uh, a range of outcome tests. So to summarize, the current standards for teacher preparation have been ineffective and inadequate, or certainly were up to the point that we developed the IDA standards. Um, few teacher prep programs uh, exist that really impart the content that's necessary to get results. And we chose to respond to what essentially was a void um, because standards that existed for teachers at that point were vague, were contradictory, were equivocal with regard to what was important. They weren't sufficiently detailed and they often were not really aligned with scientific research. And also we wanted to uh, write our standards in such a way that we could improve, hopefully, the alignment between what goes on in so-called regular education, teacher training, and special ed and remedial services. So let me say uh, a little more about what the standards are trying to get at. Uh, Okay, the, the, the first section is the foundation concepts about oral and written language learning. And these include these big ideas. How are language and reading related? Why are we saying that teachers need to be teachers of language? Why is learning to read unnatural? How does this process unfold over time? How, for example, how are beginning readers different from fluent readers psychologically? And how do good readers differ from poor readers psychologically? Um, so in order to get these ideas across, uh, we in, in our approach um, have really put a lot of importance on some basic theoretical models that are well vetted in the scientific literature. So, for example, the simple view of reading, which says simply that uh, reading comprehension is the result, uh, is the product of word recognition and language comprehension. This is an idea that's referred to in many papers throughout the scientific literature. So when there is a consensus of this kind, we feel no hesitation about asking teachers to understand what this means and to thoroughly consider uh, what the implications are for their own instruction. We also um, have permission from Hall Scarborough to use the reading rope model, which now is quite ubiquitous, which is a great thing, but it really elaborates this idea of the simple view of reading and specifies what the measurable strands are in, in the reading rope uh, in these uh, large uh, subcomponents of learning to read. And we explore the interactions among these strands, how they develop over time, and uh, what um, approaches and uh, methods of instruction, beginning with best basic lesson frameworks, uh, will be most likely to address all of what goes into reading. And a model like this um, it has to be also um, aligned with neuroscience. And so we, while we're not going to be brain scientists, we do feel it's important for teachers to at least be uh, aware of uh, major findings from neuroscience about why learning to read is unnatural uh, and what the brain has to construct in a way of processing systems and pathways among uh, these different subsystems in the brain that have to be recruited for the brain to learn to read. And we talk about that in uh, teacher-friendly terms, but also talk about the implications. Uh, this is a basic model that Mark Seidenberg and colleagues offered as, as far back as um, uh, 1989, which again recurs in the scientific literature over and over. So we think that teacher training needs to honor and hang its hat on scientific models 
around which we have enormous consensus, even though the finer points of these models are being vetted all the time by uh, current scientific investigations, um, we think they're solid enough to provide a basis for everything else that we're teaching the teachers. The second major area is knowledge of the structure of language. And again, uh, we find over and over through um, testing of one kind or another, the teachers basically are uh, in need of uh, all of this information that we can never assume that anyone understands any of this. And in fact, uh, what we encounter all the time is many misconceptions about uh, what a phoneme is, how many phonemes there are in words, how they sound, how English orthography is structured, and so on. So what do we do about that? We refer back to the idea that, uh, first of all, uh, phoneme awareness and orthography are systems of language. And then we need to teach teachers how these systems work and that they are systems. They are not just um, sort of random uh, facts that we teach uh, kids or, or we don't approach it at an associative level, we approach it at a conceptual level and then teach teachers a lot of factual information about what is what. For example, um, phoneme grapheme correspondence, which Linnea Erie, for example, has written about for three or four decades. Um, we work a lot with teachers on phoneme grapheme correspondence, and, and this is uh, going to transfer into direct work with students, but teachers need to go through this kind of activity where they have to map the graphemes that represent speech sounds with single speech sounds that have been identified through phoneme segmentation. So we find often it's a revelation for teachers to know that in the word numbed, for example, there are four speech sounds, each box stands for speech sound, and that the sounds are n, uh, m, d, and that the past tense ed is, is a single speech sound in oral language, and that that is an inherent linguistically complex uh, idea for students to grasp, but first the teachers has, have to understand it consciously, explicitly, and then have a strategy for uh, educating students about how this element of language is working. Uh, and then in the area of semantics, which is so important for vocabulary development, we uh, need to emphasize the difference between breadth of vocabulary and depth of vocabulary and how each one of those aspects of vocabulary development is addressed in the classroom and in indirect and direct instruction. So here, is, uh, uh, here are elements of language uh, uh, that have to be discussed and considered it within the whole realm of meaningful relationships that uh, it adhere to any word that we have stored in our mental dictionaries. Um, and then, um, and this is just a very brief uh, sort of touching on some of the things that are in the standards. Um, when we get into the area of understanding dyslexia and other learning disabilities, and I, I would add to this, all reading difficulties, all challenges that are inherent in learning to read uh, that are behind this statistic that 30 to 40 percent of students in many school districts are below basic in reading or more, depending on where you are. Um, the standard says uh, we want teachers to match symptoms of the major subgroups of poor readers as established by research, including those with dyslexia, and identify typical case study profiles of those individuals. Now, behind that statement is our uh, awareness as a committee that uh, kids with reading difficulties have to be... Uh, assessed 
from a theoretical framework that is grounded in science or otherwise people go off in directions that are really unproductive. And those are very common, unfortunately, and they're, they include things like learning styles, which are meaningless from a scientific perspective. Um, queuing systems, which are a scourge on our field because they, these ideas have led teachers away from what really matters in remediating reading difficulties. Uh, levels of reading, as if you could know what to do with a given student based on what level of readers uh, they're on. This is also meaningless in terms of characterizing the type of processing difficulty that a student is presenting and having a strategy for addressing it directly. Um, we see kids being uh, classified by their interest levels. Well, um, we don't think that's very productive either unless students are at the point of independent reading and, and book choice. Uh, gender, boys and girls, well, they each need structured language teaching. IQ, that's not productive either because uh, whether they have um, average IQs, low average IQs, or high IQs, they're going to need instruction that is based on these principles of structured language and literacy. So we want teachers to have a basic idea of what is going to matter as they classify kids. And while it's true that not all kids are the same, and they will, prevent, they, they will present various uh, profiles of strengths and weaknesses across, we can say these three uh, major areas, but now as we dig into it in research, even these are questionable because this seems kind of simple-minded, but I would say, broadly speaking, we have some kids with specific language comprehension problems who are relatively strong in these other areas. We have some kids with very specific severe problems with phonological processing that are measurable on tests like the CTOP and so on. And we have some kids who seem to have a very specific weakness in building fluency in word recognition. Um, and those problems are often associated with naming speed difficulties. Uh, sometimes the, this is called a, a specific orthographic processing weakness. The field is still very confused about what's what here and what terminology to use. But anyway, kids aren't all alike. So we have some kids who look relatively okay on tests of phoneme awareness and, and, and yet have a heck of a time uh, establishing word recognition and uh, reading fluency. And what we find actually is that most kids have a mix of these problems. So what does the teacher need to be prepared to do? The teacher needs to understand these various uh, symptoms, how they present, and needs to have strategies for grouping kids and tailoring instruction for the strengths and weaknesses that the student presents. Um, this slide, I think this was in uh, Patricia Mathis's presentation in the last webinar, but certainly the idea here is that if we do the right thing with students, we see measurable effects in um, uh, uh, neuro imaging um, on the left cerebral hemisphere of students with reading difficulties who start out having uh, build very few connections uh, between sounds and symbols that they're trying to connect up in order to read words and after remediation of phoneme graphene correspondences mainly we see a lot of activation uh, where these pathways uh, eventually learn to connect. Um, so we also then need to teach teachers how to use assessments. We all talk about database decision making, but um, a lot can go on in assessment that is not particularly uh, productive and that is very time consuming. So part of a good uh, preparation program for teachers and good professional development is to clarify for them the difference between screening, diagnosis, progress monitoring, and outcome measures. This is very important because 
Um, uh, they, they need to be ready to use any specific tool available to them for a specific purpose that has been defined ahead of time. Uh, and uh, along with that, they need the clinical skills of looking at writing samples and oral reading uh, uh, responses and um, oral language production in order to uh, analyze the underlying uh, uh, dynamics of language learning and language learning difficulties that are apparent in the work products of the student. And then another section of the standards talk about the applications of structured language and literacy teaching. What are the actual teaching behaviors that a student, that, that a teacher needs in order to get these better results with students? What are the observ observable competencies? What would an observer in a classroom be looking for to know that this is going on. Uh, so all those, uh, there's, there's quite a, a list of things. And uh, for example, uh, under phonological skills, we want the teachers to be able to articulate each of the speech sounds, to count the speech sounds in words, but also to model for students how speech sounds are articulated uh, because the teacher will know about articulatory phonetics if they are adequately prepared to work with students with um, weaknesses in the area of phonology. Okay, so a uh, sixth area of the standards uh, is a list of ethical standards. Uh, for example, um, you're not supposed to harm students. And this one is very important to me. Um, avoid making unfounded claims of any kind regarding the training experience credentials affiliations and degrees of those providing services um, in our field unfortunately we have not done a good enough job uh, uh, sort of monitoring ourselves for how we license certify and and uh, uh, accredit individuals and programs, and we need to be clear about uh, the difference between a person with real expertise who's qualified to make uh, certain, um, uh, say, qualified to supervise others, for example. Um, and that's uh, part of what we're trying to carry out at, at the present time. So all of that first section of the standards is aimed at all teachers of reading, and especially those who are going to be in classrooms and in public schools working with students who never get a diagnosis of learning disability or dyslexia, who may be very impaired in their reading, and who are very dependent on what teachers um, will do with them uh, whether or not they have an IEP. The second section is about the standards for uh, practitioners who want another level of certification uh, in reading disabilities or dyslexia, who will be functioning in clinical or private practice settings or school settings that will honor this credential. Uh, so uh, you all can read what those standards say, but they include asking individuals, uh, all individuals actually, who are certified by IDA at any level to pass an approved exam that is aligned with the knowledge and practice standards. Um, and then for um, practitioners and specialists in reading disabilities and dyslexia, they have to complete a practicum with a recognized and certified instructor. Uh, they have to demonstrate instructional proficiency that's responsive to student needs and document that they're able to get student progress, be accountable for student progress, and then specialists or therapists at the second level um, need yet a more advanced skill level, uh, 
uh, proficiency across a wider range of student difficulties and a greater, a greater level of skill in the use of uh, diagnostics. Um, and where are we now? So this is a good place to end the webinar. IDA has been working hard for the last six years since the standards were approved by the board um, to develop a process for program accreditation. And now uh, I'm not sure exactly how many institutions have been accredited uh, because their programs align with the standards and use the standards in formulating the uh, curriculum for their teachers in training. I think there are approximately 20 at this point, maybe more, but those are listed on the website. Accreditation has been um, uh, sort of uh, done through um, a list of uh, uh, 40 or so volunteers that have stepped up to serve on accreditation committees. And we thank them very much for their service in this regard. And a great triumph of the IDA um, board has been to develop the certification exam, which is now available to all who seek certification at any level. I have taken the exam and passed it, and I would recommend that all of you teachers and educators who are interested in demonstrating your expertise, go ahead and take the exam. And then um, the certification process for structured literacy practitioners and therapists is um, uh, now underway. I have not been uh, party to a lot of those activities. So you will have to go to the websites and um, consult the office staff and the board of IDA to get more information about certification at any of these levels, regular teacher level, um, uh, dyslexia practitioner level, dyslexia therapist level. And if your program is interested in going through an accreditation review, um, also the IDA board is managing those requests and the accreditation process. So at this point, I uh, wind up by just saying that it's been a long, hard fight. And as I think back to where I started uh, as a teacher, when in 1970 or so, when I first stepped into a classroom, knowing nothing myself and feeling completely inadequate to help the students who were in front of me who had reading disabilities. Um, when I think back over those decades that I've been involved with this field, now about 50 years, um, I think we have come a long way, but it has been more difficult than I ever anticipated. The resistance to these ideas has been astonishing to me. And it um, uh, makes me um, more patient to see how long it takes, but also more determined because I've seen how much progress we've been able to make to promote awareness of the nature of learning difficulties in reading language, spelling and writing. And we have come so far in our research, uh, the research that informs everything we do, that now our major task is to translate all of that into classroom and clinic and make sure that all of our teacher preparation is as aligned as possible with that fabulous body of work. So I think with that, I will sign off and thank everyone who has joined 
uh, today and everyone who believes that this is important, I would just encourage you to keep on um, advocating for the use of the standards, keep on advocating for appropriate instruction for our, our kids. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Moats, for an excellent presentation. I'd like to remind everyone that the presentations, the slideshow, and answers to any of today's questions will be posted within seven to 10 days at dyslexiaida.org and at hooteducation.com. A link will be, will be provided to the IDA by the IDA in a follow-up email, which will include a certificate for your participation in today's webinar. For those of you who are looking for coaching support, please visit hooteducation.com, and you may also visit the IDA's website to get additional resources to support those that you're working with who have dyslexia. We look forward to seeing you Orlando. We look forward to seeing you in Orlando at the end of the month. Thank you again for your participation today.